Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, before I get carried away and change tack, I want to show my true colors and start over with a clean slate. It might be a bit touch and go, but if we tow the line, everything will be above board. I know, it sounds a little bit like what you'd expect to hear in a business meeting today, the kind of jargon they throw around in modern day companies. But all of those idioms and expressions actually have origins from hundreds and hundreds of years of sailing. It turns out, and yes, to turn out is probably another one, that we all use dozens and dozens of sailing and shipboard expressions every day without even realizing it. So today, here are some of the most interesting maritime saying you've been using this whole time, but didn't know it. Have you ever been carried away by something? Today we use it to describe getting over enthusiastic and then essentially going overboard with something. Hey, that was another one. Anyway, getting carried away in your excitement is a perfectly reasonable thing. But did you know the origin of this expression is probably nautical? William Shakespeare used it all the way back in his play Henry IV Part I in about 1595, meaning to take something too far. But it's likely he got the saying from sailors and ships' crews. Back then, sailing ships ruled the waves. Their tall wooden masts supported massive canvas sails that would, of course, fill with the wind and drive the ship on. But knowing how to sail your ship was of massive importance. In combat against enemy warships, speed was of the essence. So in a breeze, the sails would be set or trimmed so the ship could go as quickly as possible. But too many sails set could be disastrous. If the wind was too strong, and there was too much sail surface area in the masts, then the wind could break the yards or the spars carrying the sails clear off the ship, even the whole mast in extreme instances, and this was known as carrying away. In fact, parts of the ship, like the rudder or bowsprit, the long spar at the front, could get carried away by heavy seas too, broken off from the ship and taken out to sea. Of course, getting carried away by our enthusiasm is a little bit like the wind filling our sails too much and then steering us directly into disaster. Speaking of sails, being wind powered had some small disadvantages. For example, a ship just couldn't sail into the wind. The wind would need to fill the ship's sails to push it along from behind or to the side. So to sail upwind, ships would need to zigzag so that the wind would always catch the sails from an angle, a process known as tacking. So today, to change tack means to do something like that. In the face of a challenge, to change your direction and try something new. Now you might describe something important as a mainstay. Let me think of a, a spontaneous example. You could describe Ocean Lighted Designs as a mainstay in the Maritime History YouTube space. I don't know how that one came to me, I just thought of it on the spot. But the truth is, it's an expression that means something extremely important. If something is the mainstay, it is critical. Well, if you've used that expression, then congratulations. You're basically an 1800s sailor because a mainstay is actually a very specific and important part of the ship. Sailing ships are absolutely covered in all kinds of ropes and cables called the rigging. It looks complicated to us land lovers, but to sailors it was as familiar as the strings on a guitar, each one with a very specific purpose. Most of the rigging was called running rigging, ropes used to handle the ship's sails and work the pulleys and blocks to maneuver the ship. But some of the rigging was called standing rigging, stationary lines designed to remain in place and provide support. Now some ship's masts were well over 100 feet tall, towering columns of spruce or fir wood that were once massive trees, and they weighed tons. The ship would be rocking and rolling the whole time it was at sea, and when you consider the additional weight of all the sails and spars and the sheer force of the wind, you begin to realize how much pressure those masts were under. Shrouds and stays were the huge cables that ran from the masts down onto the deck to actually hold them in place. Shrouds from the side of the mast and stays from the rear or the front. The mainstay was one of the most important lines, helping support the largest mast, the main mast, to the ship. If the mainstay was broken, then the mast stood a very high chance of falling backwards or forwards in a heavy sea. So because of this, the mainstay had a critical purpose and was obviously very important. But what about when somebody shows their true colours? This can often be a bad thing, when somebody's been hiding their true character, but then suddenly reveals it in dramatic fashion. Back in the days before radar and radio, keeping the element of surprise in a navy engagement was of the utmost importance, because it could mean the difference between an easy, bloodless victory or the devastating carnage of defeat. Warships and privateers, the latter being 
essentially glorified state-sponsored pirate ships, would hunt enemy vessels and convoys and try and trick them into a false sense of security before attacking. The rules of war dictated that if a ship was to attack its enemy, it had to be flying its home nation's flag or naval ensign. But in the lead up to the attack, ships often adopted disguises pretending to be friendly ships or from allied nations. They would often then creep up close until at the very last minute, they would pull down the fake flags and run up their own and show their true colors. Colors being an antiquated term for flags. Well, here's a fun one. Have you ever been three sheets to the wind? If you've overindulged in your favorite alcoholic beverage, chances are you might be feeling a little bit silly. Somebody who's drunk can be referred to as being three sheets to the wind. And of course, this has its origins in the golden days of sail. A ship's sheets were the lines or ropes that could be used to control the sail's trim, that is the angle of the sail relative to the wind for maximum efficiency and speed. If the sheets are let loose to just blow in the wind, the sail will flap dramatically. Now, some have suggested this makes a boat or ship lurch about like a drunken sailor, but I'm actually more of the opinion that such a move would be seen as remarkably untidy by professional sailors, and it would indicate that something was out of the ordinary and the ship was probably out of control. Now, originally the saying was actually sheets in the wind and not to the wind, which actually would make more sense. A sailor with sheets in the wind was not in control of themselves because they'd had too much of their favorite drink, probably rum. Now, this is an interesting one. Have you ever been at loggerheads with somebody? You might think it's a lumberjack expression, but it's not. To be at loggerheads means to be in a stark disagreement with somebody, and usually in a bad state of tension. A loggerhead is actually a type of tool which was popular in the days of sail. Back then, the ship's decks were pine or teak, planked and sealed with pitch in between the cracks. So to melt the pitch, carpenters or shipbuilders would heat the loggerhead, which was an iron ball on a long pole-like handle, and then dunk it into a bucket of pitch, essentially like a tar, to keep it hot and liquefied so it could be applied to the deck. But it could also be used as a pretty handy shipboard weapon in case of quarrels or in the event of an attempted boarding by the enemy. To be at loggerheads then means to be in a state of conflict with somebody else, in theory, swinging one of these ridiculous things above your head and screaming like a banshee while you do it. Have you ever started something over with a clean slate? Well, if you have, you're basically a sailor. Ships at sea back in the 1800s and before didn't have anything like GPS or modern navigational equipment. Some of the most important devices on board the ship were actually related to keeping time and making observations. Now, aside from knowing how long you'd been at sea and how long until you might see land again, timekeeping devices were crucial in figuring out your position because the longitude of your position couldn't just be figured out from the stars like the latitude could. You needed to know the time difference between your shipboard clock or chronometer and the designated point known as the prime meridian. So keeping track of everything that was happening at sea was hugely important. Sighting other ships, changes in temperature or the course, it could all prove extremely useful. Now a ship's watch was essentially the crew who worked for bursts of four hours at a time on and off. Typically near the ship's wheel, the watchkeeper would record events on a slate throughout the watch. So the slate being like a blackboard where simple observations could be chalked down. Now this was anything from the ship's speed to its heading or if she had to tack. At the end of the watch, any very important details would be entered into the log, but if all was well, then the slate could be wiped clean for the next watch to start over, therefore beginning with a clean slate. Finally, we have come to the bitter end. Now this one seems self-explanatory. It's usually the conclusion or the end of something that is drawn out and long. You finally arrived at the end and it feels bitter. But that's probably not quite it. It's actually thought to have a sailing origin. We talked about all the working rigging and the standing rigging on a ship. Lines used to hoist sails or operate the ship. Many lines were actually secured at one end to the deck, tied around bollards or bits. I'm sure you can see where this is going. The other end, the actual one being used for something, like say, hoisting a small boat's anchor or a sail, is known as the working end. So if a sailor was paying out or releasing his line from the deck and he was running out of line, he could say he was approaching the bitter end, the end that was tied securely to the bit. An 1867 sailor's dictionary puts it simply, when a chain or rope is paid out to the bitter end, no more remains to be let go. So there you have it. Why do we have these expressions and why have they stuck around for so long? Well, the truth is that sailors used to be basically everywhere back in the day, sailing all around the world and coming up with all their own sayings and expressions and spreading them around with them. 
There are dozens, dozens more, and we'll cover some more next time because it's a very interesting nod to our sailing ancestors. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.